Okay, great. So we're really excited that Scott's here with us today. Scott is a PhD candidate in both the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology and Entomology graduate programs at UMass. And his major interest, his research is focused on ant agriculture, as you've heard in the title of the talk today. Um, so just a little bit about how the evening's going to work. It's going to be about an hour long. Um, our conversation is going to be broken into three parts. At the end of each section, we'll pause and we'll take questions from the audience. So please put up your hand, we'll call on you, and Scott will answer your questions. I'll try to. <laughs> he will do his best. Um, great. So I think we're ready to launch into the science and get going. So here we are in Hadley, a great agricultural town. There are tractors driving around. We see fields full of corn. There are pumpkins available for sale now. Um, pretty much this picture here sums up maybe how we relate to agriculture. Yeah, these guys up here should be familiar to everyone in the audience, I would think. So there's a pretty basic process underlying a lot of agriculture, right? These are all domesticated species. That's right. So. Agriculture is uh, it's, it's one of the most important uh, historical events in, in human history. Uh, it's, it's had a great impact on human evolution and the way that our societies are organized. Uh, and one of the, the most important parts of that is the, the origin of these relationships, um, these, these domesticated relationships between humans and animals and crops that we farm. Um, and just to give you an example and, and, and talk a bit about the history of domestication first to start you all off, um, we'll go with a, a crowd pleaser here, the domestication <laughs> of dogs. Um, so you're probably all familiar with dogs, you probably like dogs very much. Um, and you may also be aware that dogs are uh, a, a domesticated lineage of gray wolves. Um, somewhere around 18,000 to 32,000 years ago, uh, dogs, or, or, or proto-dogs, um, began this evolutionary process. Um, they are actually our oldest uh, domesticated associates. So dogs came long before any of the other domesticated animals or crops. Um, the other domesticated animals start to show up somewhere around 12 to 15,000 years ago. So there's another approximately 10,000 years um, almost of history between humans and, and proto-dogs, you know, the early, early domesticated dogs, uh, before any other domesticated animals show up or crops. Um, so when we talk about do uh, domesticated dogs, um, we're talking about associating with humans that are still hunter-gatherer populations. They're not quite into the agricultural scene yet, so they're not as settled, they're not growing crops. So how, how would that process have worked then? I mean, you see a wolf and you don't think, well, yeah, I think I'd like to take that for a walk. Yeah. Have to pet it. Yeah. Well, our ideas of how domestication proceeded have changed quite a bit um, in, in the last uh, two decades or so. Uh, so the old idea of domestication, uh, with, with dogs specifically, um, was that these hunter-gatherer societies would have maybe grabbed some wolf pups and brought them into their camps and started to raise them and try to tame them. Um, and we're, we're coming to realize that this is sort of an antiquated idea. Um, the, the more generally accepted, uh, more recent idea is that this was actually a case of um, a slow progression of, of mutual acceptance of one another. Um, so what may have happened actually is that wolves or, or proto-dogs um, would have been uh, wolves that are, are uh, tolerant hanging out around human camps. So they would have they would have stayed maybe on the periphery of these camps and you know they would have been receiving maybe some food scraps. You know, they're they're benefiting from this relationship by getting sort of a, 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 a sustainable um, a food source, you know, something that they can rely on. Humans are really good hunters, they're bringing in lots of prey. And these wolves may have been benefiting by getting some of that food, getting some of those scraps. Um, you can imagine that humans were starting to benefit from this as well because 
just like modern day dogs, um, these wolves would have been a really nice early warning system. So if they had taken down prey and there were other predators in the area that wanted to move in on them and maybe, you know, steal that prey away, um, these early dogs could have been really useful in protecting you know, those, those hunts and uh, keeping these other predators away. Uh, they could have been, you know, um, serving a purpose even just around the habitation, uh, you know, similar to the way that dogs will bark when the mailman comes around. Uh, you know, the, the old version of mailman coming around was, you know, these wolves barking at other intruders, other threats, um, and helping to protect uh, humans from, from these dangers. Uh, and thousands of years later, people started to figure out, like, okay, we have. Okay, great. I think that's a really, a really nice example of domestication, or maybe a mutualism that seems to be pretty stable through history. Right. So, so we're getting into a little bit of terminology here, and it, it might be uh, useful to talk about what, or, you know, describe what we're talking about here. So domestication is really a special type of relationship that we call mutualism. Um, and, and mutualism is actually one, one end of a spectrum of associations between species that we uh, recognize. And um, with mutualism being at one end of that spectrum, so one extreme of that spectrum is that when two species are interacting with one another, um, there's a, a certain cost that you know, a certain input that they put into that relationship. If you have dogs at your house, you may recognize, yes, there are definitely some inputs that I have to put into this relationship. <laughs> um, but you might be getting something out of that relationship too. You're, you're, you're getting something from your dog. You're, keep, you're keeping them caring for them for a reason, right? Um, as long as the benefits that you're receiving from an association are outweighing the costs that you put into it for both parties, uh, it's considered a mutualistic uh, interaction. At the other extreme of that, you, uh, we, we talk about parasitism as being the, the other extreme. Uh, parasitism is basically an association where one party is benefiting at the expense of the other party. Um, so there's a, a net gain for one of the enactors and a net loss for the other enactor. And and mutualisms are considered to be relatively unstable. So um, theoretically, we expect mutualisms to be pretty short-lived and to break down. Um, and the main ways, the, the main just categories in which they break down is through uh, um, basically cheating. Cheating often leads to parasitism. Um, there's also reversion or escape. So when mutualist partners just decide not to interact anymore. Uh, or you could have extinction events leading to the breakdown of mutualism. Um, but generally, we expect parasitism to be the, the main way in which mutualism is breakdown. So it sounds like we can almost think about interactions between species sort of the way we think about interactions between individuals. If you don't follow the social rules, the interaction is going to break down That's right. and not be stable. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I think this is a great time to pause. And if anyone in the audience has a question they'd like to ask Scott, please put your hand up. <laughs> Here they go. We went from wolves to chihuahuas in 300 years. So no, the question no. was, did we go to, from wolves to chihuahuas in 300 years? No, so the history of dog domestication is stretching back. Um, it's estimated from anywhere between 18,000 to 32,000 years. So that's when the first, in, you know, in, in archaeological days, that's the time span in which dog remains start to show up in human cases. I thought you said the act of when the humans realized they could start manipulating the traits, that that only happened in the last three or four hundred years? Right, so to clarify, um, within the last about 300 years, that's when we start to see the proliferation of different breeds of dogs. Well, that's what so, I mean. so that's when from Chihuahua to Great Dane, yeah. you know, starts to show up. So it's only in 300 years it, yeah. it wouldn't have been a wolf that was present 300 years ago that was being artificially selected. It would have been something much more like a right. sort of general general type of dog. Yeah, I mean they were they were already dogs at that point. Um, I, I guess the the closest approximation to what they would have looked like would have been sort of the wild wild dogs. Um, yeah.
Um, can you give us some examples of where mutualism uh, went toward parasitism when humans were involved? Oh, are there examples of mutualism going to parasitism involving humans? Mm -hmm. Whether the human is the one that became the parasite or allowed an, an, another animal to become the parasite. Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of an example. Uh, but it, I'll, I'll keep it in mind. If something occurs to me later, I'll try to... Because it would be a lot of work to domesticate something to the point where it would be neutralism and then to let that abandon or get out of control. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are instances of certain populations of domesticated animals escaping from domestication. Um, it happens occasionally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Is it a historical thing that people actually ate the dogs? Is it a historical thing that people actually ate the dogs? Uh, it, it's certainly possible. I don't know for sure, but... Well, so the archaeological evidence that they use, uh, there, there are two bodies of evidence that we're using to kind of reconstruct the history of the domestication of dogs. Uh, so archaeological digs would be one of them where we find, you know, wolf remains showing up in human camps, you know, they would be buried in the proximity of, of human remains. Um, whether or not that's because they're feeding on them, I'm not really, sh I, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but um, yeah, the, I mean, the the other line of evidence is is molecular data that we can you know date back to the divergence between dogs and wolves. Uh, you know, we, we right that wouldn't tell us much of the social. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Okay, let's take one last question on this hey, topic. How do we figure into this? <laughs> They're coming up next. They're on their way. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, great, so let's get back into it. Sure. Um, so one of the kind of big things that we were talking about in the last section was how cognition isn't necessary for domestication events to occur. That's right, especially in the early stages of domestication. Um, cognition didn't really play much of a role. Okay, so knowing that, we can kind of think that maybe a lot of non-humans then have, have domesticated things. Right, so, so this is where, I mean for me, this is where domestication actually becomes really interesting. Um, if cognition isn't a necessary a component of the early stages of domestication, you know, the, the real kickoff of domestication doesn't really require intelligence. Um, it, can, it can just occur uh, through natural selection. It means that it kind of opens the gates up. It's not just a human thing anymore. Uh, there's potential for lots of different organisms to engage in, in you know, what we would recognize as domestication. Um, and just to give you an example, it's, it's a non-ant example, but just to tell you, you know, how extreme this really can go, there is a type of amoeba, so a single-celled organism, um, that is suspected, you know, when they, when they f colonize, when they group together, they're actually suspected uh, to be farming a type of bacterium. Um, so it's, it's potentially, you know, a case of domestication, uh, you know, it, among single-celled organisms. Yeah, you don't even have to be multicellular to do right, it. Right, right. <laughs> so, Scott, do you have um, maybe some examples in insects, or specifically ants, yeah. where agriculture or domestication is going on? Yeah, let's dive into the ants. Um, so, this is probably the group that is familiar to most of you. You've probably seen these guys before. These are the leafcutter ants. Um, and they're found in the New World tropics and subtropics. So from, from uh, South America up into North America, you, you would be able to find the fungus gardening ants. Um, the leaf cutters in particular are, are restricted to Central and South America. 
Um, so what, what these ants are doing is going out and collecting um, cuttings of leaves and they're carrying them back to their nest. Um, we used to think, way back in the day, people used to think that the ants were feeding off of the leaves, but then we came to realize that what they're actually doing is bringing the leaves back as fodder to feed the fungus that they're cultivating. Uh, so they raise this fungus inside of their massive, massive nests underground, and they actually feed off of the fungus instead, not off of the leaves. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the, their, um, it's, it's actually a really great example of agriculture, just to, to kick off with of, uh, insect agriculture, um, because of how complex these associations are. Uh, so th they have been doing this for somewhere around 40 million years. And how long have we been doing agriculture? We've been doing agriculture for about 15,000 years. <laughs> They've been doing it for about 40 million years. Um, so they're very, very good at it. <laughs> And they have evolved a great deal of complexity in these uh, uh, associations um, to the point where, uh, just to give you an example of how crazy this gets, there is a cast of ants, so a, a type of worker that's sole job is to sit on the backs of the leaf cutters, the ones who are running back and forth and foraging for leaves. They sit on their back and they fend off a type of parasitic fly that tries to come in and lay eggs on the, the head of uh, these ants. They're, they're called um, ant decapitating flies. Uh, and they can do quite a bit of damage to the colony. They'll lay an egg on it, the egg will um, hatch and will start to eat the ant from the inside out and then they'll pop off their head to, to get out and pupate and become an adult. Um, so you can imagine why the ants, you know, it's beneficial if the ants can protect themselves against this sort of attack from the forward flies. And, you know, there's a cast that is responsible for just sitting there and fighting them off as the ants are running back and forth foraging for the leaves. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> they're pretty wild. Yeah, so is this kind of one lineage of ants that does this fungus gardening, or is it pretty widespread throughout ants, like a lot of ants? Grow fungus? There, it's, there, um, there is one origin, a single origin of fungus cultivation. Uh, but there's actually, you know, that group has been very successful. So there is actually um, quite a number of species of ants that tend to fungus, but they're all related to one another. There's one common ancestor for all of the fungus. So it was a great thing to evolve and it's yeah, different. Yeah, it seems to be a really <laughs> successful strategy. I mean, it worked out for us pretty well too. Right? So the ants obviously get a benefit because they get to eat the fungus. But That's right. does the fungus also get a benefit in this relationship? Yeah, so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the services that ants provide to them is protection from competing fungi and from things that are trying to eat the fungi, other things that are trying to eat them. Um, so in particular, there is a bacterium that specializes on uh, infecting these, these fungi and feeding on them. And the ants actually are able to coat their fungus in an antibiotic that they produce on their body. Uh, so they coat their fungus and protect it from these bacterial infections. Uh, the queens, when, when a new queen is going off to establish a colony, she will also take a bit of this fungus in her mouth and carry it with her on her mating flight. Um, so the, another service that the ants are providing is dispersion of these fungi. Um, and that, that little bit of fungus will serve as kind of the seed for the new colony that she will raise. Wow, very specialized. Yeah, yeah, very specialized, very complex agricultural system. Yeah, so if we were to make an analogy between these ants growing fungus and maybe some type of human agriculture, would it be fair to compare it to growing corn or raising mushrooms, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, um, people very often in the literature will draw analogies between the leafcutter ants and, um, you know, crops, you know, crop propagation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Neat. So, is this the only type of? agriculture that ants do? It certainly is not. <laughs> uh, so getting into the branch of ant agriculture that I'm particularly interested in, um, we're going to talk about relationships called trophobioses. Uh, and these are associations 
between ants and other insects, um, where the ants are, again, they're providing services in exchange for a food reward. Um, and that food reward comes in the form of, of what's called honeydew. Um, now, uh, this, what I'm mainly focusing on here and what I'm mainly talking about are um, associations between ants and an order of insects called hemiptera. Um, so, hemiptera for a few examples would be aphids, um, tree hoppers, and plant hoppers. These are probably familiar things. Scale insects are, are kind of an obscure group of insects that you may not be familiar with, and they're actually the ones that I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about. They're the ones that I specialize on. Um, so, if you are familiar with scale insects, it's probably because they've been attacking your garden or your cactus in your living room. You probably think they're very pesky. Uh, they produce you know, waxy substances, um, so that, that may be familiar to you. Hemipterans are the main group of insects that ants associate with, but there are a couple of other examples across the insect tree of life. Um, a really well documented one are the, the caterpillars of lysine and butterflies are very specialized on associating with ants, and there are a few other weirdo examples that crop up here and there. But for the most part, it's hemipterans. Cool. So you mentioned honeydew. So honeydew yeah. is the thing that they're providing. That's right. And honeydew is something that they don't want? Right. So, um, <clears throat> so honeydew is, it has been um, sort of problematic for hemiptera. What, let, me, let me back up a little bit and explain what this is. So hemipterans are specialized on feeding on uh, mostly plant fluids. So they feed on either phloem or xylem. And these are the, the vascular systems of plants, basically. So the phloem and xylem are transporting water and nutrients throughout the plant. And hemipterans tap into that resource uh, and feed on it, but it's, the phloem is very, very um, nutri uh, uh, nitrogen poor. So in order to get enough nitrogen from their diet, hemipterans have to consume a lot of phloem or a lot of xylem. Um, and what that means is that they're left with uh, the problem of getting rid of a bunch of sugar water that's left over, because that's what the, the rest of phloem and xylem are made out of, is sugary water. So the way that they've solved this problem, or, or you know, what they have to do for the most part, is expel this excess sugar water. Um, so when we're talking about honeydew, what we're actually talking about is insect poo, and that is just sugar water, um, basically. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that the hemipterans have faced is being able to expel all this excess fluid, all this excess honeydew. Um, Having honeydew uh, around you, if it, you know, if it's just st sticking around, uh, it becomes problematic because it's inviting fungi or molds to come and, and infect, and you know that can that can kill the insect. Um, so, hemipterans have been very concerned about you know coming up with ways to get rid of honeydew. Um, one of the really clever, or, or you know, not necessarily clever, but one of the really interesting ways that they've come up with getting rid of honeydew is by associating with ants and having the ants gather that honeydew and uh, it serves as their food reward in these associations. There are some other really you know, fun, cool stories that go along with getting rid of honeydew that I'll just mention quickly. Um, so this is an example of a scale insect from the family Orthoseidae. It's an ensign scale. And the body of the insect is actually just the circular region at the top. Straight up here? Yeah, yeah. And if you look right here, I'll just point out. So if you look right here, uh, what I'm pointing out to you is the anal opening of the scale insect. And behind that, it's not the body anymore. What that actually is, is just a waxy construction. Uh, they basically created a slip and slide for their honeydew <laughs> that hangs off the back. When they excrete honeydew, it'll just whoop, slide right <laughs> off of that uh, that you know waxy protuberance that they produce. <laughs> wow, that is pretty creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, getting back to the uh, 
ant, ant associations. Uh, again, one of the really interesting ways in which honey, in, in which mithrins have um, you know, uh, come up with, with getting rid of honeydew, and one of the benefits that they receive from attendant ants is this service. Uh, so they produce this excess amount of fluid uh, that is really attractive to ants. And the ants are kind of behaving like the insect mafia in return. Uh, so they're providing protection for a price. Uh, and, you know, again, that price is some sort of food reward. And if you can't pay up, um, the relationship may no longer remain on friendly terms. Hmm. <laughs> I guess we can imagine how that might turn out. Yeah. So what kind of ant is this? Yeah. So what this is, uh, I'm showing you an image here of the group that I did my master's work on years ago at Towson University. Um, and this is a really fascinating uh, example of an obligate mutualism. So a mutualism where both parties are heavily reliant upon one another for survival. Um, and it's between a genus of ants called Acropaga and a group of mealybugs. This, this is another type of scale insect. Um, and it's a specific subfamily of scale insects that are associated with acropyta ants, and they're called the xenococcine mealybugs. Um, now, these guys are distributed all across the globe in the tropics and subtropics again, and they uh, uh, they have you know kind of a funny relationship. So the ants nest underground, and uh, you know they will actually take mealybugs and herd them back and forth from the nest chambers to root systems and put them out to pasture, basically. So we see you know, an ant herding a mealybug right here. Um, they really do take them out to the root systems, plop them onto the roots, gather honeydew for a while, and then when it's time to go home, they'll pick them up and carry them right back to the nest chamber. So this is just like taking your cows out to pasture, yeah. milking them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just, yeah. Wow. So people often draw analogies between um, trophobioses and dairy farming, if you, if you had to relate it to human agriculture and so Wow. Yeah. So I'll share with you something else that's really interesting about this group that, that I think you'll enjoy. Um, <laughs> So much like the fungus gardening ants where a queen will take a piece of the fungus with her on her mating flight, acropyca ants are really special because the queens will actually pick out a pregnant mealybug and take that mealybug along with them on their mating flight. So what we see here is a queen grasping a pregnant adult female mealybug in her mandible, right there, the little white blob, and uh, there's a male mating with so this is an example of what we call vertical transmission. There's transmission from the parent nest to the, the you know, child nest in this case. You know, this new queen is going to found a new colony. And that mealybug is going to serve as the seed individual for the new group of mealybugs that she associates with. So that mealybug is probably pretty closely related to all the other mealybugs that the queen grew up with. And it might be beneficial to her to use a known mealybug instead of some random mealybug she finds. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some degree of uh, specialization between these two lineages. Um, they actually have a very long history, again, of association. Uh, and just to, to give you an idea of how far back this goes, um, this is an image of a, an, an approximately 20 million year old amber fossil of an acropyga queen. This is an extinct species of acropyga. Um, and she is carrying what is now an extinct genus of mealybugs uh, with her in her mandibles. And they just happen to get caught in amber, uh, thankfully. You know, lucky, <laughs> lucky for us, um, <laughs> because we can learn something from them. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that the genus of mealybugs here, um, although it's extinct, it is believed to be the closest relative to the extant um, xenococcine mealybugs that they still associate with. So this relationship is going back quite a long ways. It actually goes back way beyond this. Um, this is about 20 million years old, and acropyga is believed to have been associated with xenococcines for about 40 million years. So it sounds like these associations between ants and mealybugs are 
all about the honeydew. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, what's, what I find really fascinating about this is that um, these relationships are, are surprisingly stable through time. Again, I was mentioning earlier that mutualisms are expected to be relatively unstable, and we do you know, find examples of relationships that tend to be you know, very, very stable. And um, <clears throat> it's just interesting to, to think, like, what is it that may be um, kind of reinforcing the stability of these relationships? Because physically, there's nothing stopping ants from feeding on this mealy bush if they want to. Uh, it, it's actually, in, in other systems, it has been very often suspected that ants will associate with a partner, but they'll also um, cheat in the sense that they will sometimes supplement their diet by eating some of their, their associates. Uh, and studies on aphids have actually shown that if the aphid populations are very large, the, the ones that are associated with ants, the ants are much more likely to um, feed on the aphids as well as collect honeydew from them. Uh, but if honeydew starts to become a limiting factor, so if they eat too many of those aphids and they're not getting enough honeydew, um, they're, they're, there are consequences to that. Right, yeah. so there is some kind of check on the system there. Right, right. So our current understanding of these relationships is that honeydew is a stabilizing factor in trophobioses. This need for an easy, reliable, high energy resource is keeping ants in check in these particular examples. So, you know, for example, the acropagia xenococcine relationship. Well, that's really interesting stuff, Scott. I think this is a great place to pause and see if there are any questions from the audience. If this is agriculture, who's managing the process? So if this is agriculture, yeah. who's managing the yeah, process? The group. Over the group, over the colony. Over at the colony yeah. scale. Yeah, yeah. Who who's would be managing? in charge? Who's the head farmer? Who's in charge? A lot of times people, um, People suspect that the ants are the ones kind of running the show. Um, it goes along with, with the idea of domestication being uh, kind of an, an unequal partnership where one party has a bit more control over the, you know, the, the way that things go uh, than the Is there any, I don't want to use the word fear, or thinking about that some of the, the ants that live in Central and South America are we concerned that more southern ants are going to start coming up here, coming up north with climate change happening? Um, you know, so talking about agricultural ants specifically, I don't know if there are any studies that have been done, uh, but there was a researcher who just recently graduated from OEB at UMass um, named Israel de Toro who was starting to get into sort of future projections of, of ant species um, distribution globally uh, as a result of climate change. And I think he was finding that you, you we're, we're expecting to see a shift in species from the tropics um, more, uh, up you know, to higher latitudes. So it's possible. That's a really great question. I don't think anyone has ever looked at that before. I've never seen anything about it, but that would be, yeah, that would be really interesting. What was that question? So the question was, um, like with some examples of human agriculture, uh, with diseases being transmitted uh, around different farms, maybe, um, do we see anything like mealybug spreading disease through ant agricultural colonies? Right. And we don't know. Right. Yeah, a lot of the diseases that are um, that affect human populations have actually originated from domesticated animals. Um, but I, yeah, I've, I've never thought of that before. It's actually a really, 40 million years. <laughs> it's an awfully long time for for the you know the viral or bacterial infections to you know make the switch too. So it's possible. 
So let's take maybe one more question. Maybe over here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering to what extent these, these mealing bugs are truly obligate species, like they're not found in the wild outside of association with these ants? And right. if so, do we have a sense of how how much they diverge genetically from mealing bug populations that don't need the ants to be viable? Sure. So the question was, um, how obligate is this relationship from the mealybug's point of view? And how much have the mealybugs who are associating with ants, how much have they diverged from mealybugs who don't associate with ants? Yeah, um, so it's a really good question. The xenococcine mealybugs have never been found in, uh, in the wild, you know, basically. They, they've never been found free living. They only, you know, associate with Acropyga. Um, and as far as how diverged they are, they're, uh, I mean, they're, if you look at the closest relatives to xenococcines, um, they, they look very different just in terms of, of morphological change. Um, there has been quite a bit of you know, what, what we suspect is adaptation to life with ants. Um, you know, when, when xenococcine were first discovered and were first described, people had a difficult time kind of figuring out, the, you know, the taxonomists at the time had a difficult time figuring out where do they fit in uh, because they are weird. They're very strange. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your great questions. We will have another round of questions at the end of the next segment. Um, so, to get into more of what Scott's currently doing, so we were just learning about how honeydew is this all-important stabilizing factor keeping these mutualisms going. So maybe without honeydew, the mutualism would fall apart, or the ants would cheat all the time, or I don't know what would happen. Yeah, so I mean, this, this was my line of thinking at the end of my master's when I was getting ready to kind of move on to the next project. I was starting to think about these, these relationships and, and stability of trophobiosis and think, you know, what would be the consequence of these relationships if honeydew weren't a factor? So honeydew seems to be the thing that's keeping relationships in check. What happens if honeydew is, is no longer an issue? Um, and, you know, for the, a long time, we never found any ant relationships where they weren't associating with something that was providing honeydew to them or at least a, a substitute um, to honeydew, uh, like the Lysenid caterpillars provide. They, they produce something that's similar to honeydew, but it's not actually their excrement. Um, so for a really long time, there were no examples that we were aware of. Um, it was actually just kind of serendipitous that as I was finishing up my master's, I went to this conference and I heard a talk about a really weird group of ants that were associating with uh, a type of scale insect called armored scale insects. Um, and armored scale insects are one of these really weird, uh, bizarro groups of scale insects that don't produce any honeydew. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background and perspective about armored scales, um, you may have seen these on plants before and had absolutely no idea what they were because when you look at them, you actually don't see the insect usually. What you see is the, the waxy scale covering that they produce. So they're called armored scale insects because they're producing a whole bunch of wax that they cover their body with um, and they lead a very sedentary life so they don't move around um, and they just live underneath this waxy covering. Uh, the reason why they don't move around very much is because if you look in the bottom left here, this is this is actually the insect itself. This is an adult female armored scale insect. It just looks like kind of a formless blob. Um, that's what they all look like. The armored scales are unique in that uh, when, when they're babies, when they're first born, they have legs. And what they'll usually do is just disperse, you know, a little, a little bit away from wherever their mother is. They'll settle down on the plant and insert their mouth parts into the plant. And then they'll go through a molt. Um, with that first molt, they lose their legs, and at least for the females, they stay put for the rest of their life. Um, so they end up just being kind of a little blob with mouth parts that feeds around in the plant. Um, I wanted to point out to you on the, the right here, and actually, I'll just get up here, point it out to you. So if you look here, I'm pointing out these structures to you on the, the posterior end. Um, these are the macroducts. 
of the armored scale. These are the structures that are responsible for producing that waxy scale color. Uh, and it will become clear why I'm pointing that out to you in a, in a moment. Um, so I mentioned that armored scales don't produce honeydew. Uh, this is one of the many reasons why armored scales are a, an interesting and, and weird group of insects. There is almost, it, there, there is basically no direct connection between the stomach and the rectum of armored scale insects. Uh, so their feeding biology is very different from those hemipterans. Uh, and rather than feeding on phloem or xylem, armored scale insects feed on the um, cell contents of the plant. So they don't have this whole problem of needing to take in tons and tons of fluid in order to get enough nitrogen. So they don't need to worry about expelling tons and tons of excess sugar water either. Um, what, what we think armored scales do is actually feed on the cell contents and then um, most of the waste that they produce is actually expelled back out through the mouth parts into the host plant. Uh, and what I've highlighted, there's two little pink strings that are, that are kind of connecting from the stomach down to the rectum in blue. Um, these are the only direct connections between the stomach and the rectum, and they are probably serving some sort of filtering um, function. There are very, very small amounts of nitrogenous wastes that are excreted, but for the most part, armored-scaled insects don't really poop. Um, and they don't poop because they're living underneath this waxy cover, and if you are expelling your waste into the spot where you live, that's a really bad idea. That, again, is inviting all sorts of infections and problems. Um, so armored scales have come up with a really interesting way of dealing with that. They just shoot it back out into the plant. Um, now, what makes this interesting is that uh, it, if, we, if we look at um, these, these unique armored scales that are associating with ants, we find that they are uh, what I lovingly refer to as disarmed scale insects. Um, you actually see the bodies here. They don't produce a waxy scale cover. Um, they're living inside of the galleries of, of these ants. Uh, so they're, they're associating with a type of ant called Melissa tarsus. It's a genus that is comprised of four species, and they're found only in Africa and Madagascar. And uh, these ants, will construct um, extensive galleries. They actually dig out these, these tunnels inside of the bark or just under the bark of live trees. Um, and inside of those galleries, you'll find tons and tons of armored scales. Um, so what I'm showing you here is on the left, these are some intact galleries that I collected from South Africa in 2012. Uh, and then I you know, went ahead and kind of peeled off the top of the plant to expose the galleries and show you, you know, underneath all those tiny little yellow blobs are the armored scale insects that are associated with them. Um, you don't see any ants because as soon as you expose the galleries, the ants run away. They're, they're very shy. So they run to the periphery of wherever you've destroyed uh, and they start to repair the galleries. Um, now these are, yeah, this is it. So these are uh, a, a really bizarre, really interesting group of ants, just to give you a little bit of natural history background. Um, Melissa tarsus are the only adult ants that are capable of producing silk. So they produce silk, and they will do a couple of things with it. They, they line the inside of the galleries with this silk. They will also attach it to the armored scales a lot of times. Uh, but the main thing that they do with this silk is combine it with excess sawdust and frass uh, to make a mortar. And they use that mortar to close up um, their galleries. So these galleries are actually basically an enclosed system inside of the bark or just under the bark of the trees that they're nesting. So frass is just a technical term for poop. Yeah, press is just one of those biologist words for poop. <laughs> for insect, insect. For insect poop, yeah. We have biologists really love coming up with different words for poop. So, not only do they make silk, but they also, they look a little funny, don't they? Yeah, um, 
So one of the other weird things about Melissa Carson's ants you may notice is that uh, there's nothing wrong with this ant that I'm picturing here in, in black and white. Uh, their middle pair of legs is actually twisted and tilted so that the legs face up and back. Um, this makes them really great at walking around inside of tunnels. So they're stabilizing themselves on the sides and the roof of the tunnel with their middle pair of legs, and they're scooting along the tunnel with their front and back legs. Um, but what's, what, what this means is that they're really great at walking around in tunnels. They're really terrible at walking around on flat surfaces. Uh, and hopefully this, yeah, here we go. I'll just play you a little video. This was just taken with my cell phone, so it's not the best video ever. But what I did was take a couple of Melissa Tarsus ants out and just dump them onto a flat surface and let them try to walk. Uh, and you can see that they're absolutely pathetic. They cannot walk on flat surfaces, do not walk well outside of their tunnels. Um, what this means is that they would be absolutely terrible foragers outside of the galleries. Um, they have never been sampled in, in the wild. You know, people go out and do sampling for ants and leaf litter or whatever. Um, Melissa Tarsus ants have never been found. And we believe that they don't forage outside of their galleries at all because they're very concerned about keeping themselves enclosed in there. And they would just be the worst foragers ever outside of the galleries. Um, so whatever it is that Melissa Tarsus colonies are surviving off of is coming from within their galleries. Uh, and, and they have actually massive, massive populations. Um, the, the largest Melissa Tarsus colony that has been sampled was estimated to contain about 1.5 million individual ants. And estimates of armored scale abundance is, is believed to be about um, three or four armored scales per ant. Uh, so these really, really big colonies could have somewhere between three to five million armored scales. And this is just in one tree. Uh, and, and these guys are actually quite common. If you walk around in Africa and you start peeling bark off of trees, you would, you know, you're likely to come across these guys. They're actually kind of all over the place. Um, very common. So if the ants aren't leaving the gallery, and the scales aren't producing any honeydew. Uh -huh. An ant's got to eat, right? Yeah, an ant's got to eat, and a big colony has a, a big group stomach. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you another video here while we talk about this, uh, just in the background. This, uh, so we're using really, really high-tech equipment here. Uh, this is, again, I think a camera, a, a phone camera, looking into a microscope, just to give you a close-up view. Um, but this is just a little bit of video of, an acro of a Melissa Tarsus ant tending to some of the armored scales. Um, what it's not doing is collecting honeydew or anything like that, uh, or any sort of excretions. Um, but the, the idea here, the hypothesis that I had going into this work was that, you know, if they're not getting any sort of excretion or secretion as a food reward, um, maybe they're actually just tending to armored scales as a source of meat, essentially, um, as a food source. So the food reward that they may be receiving in exchange for the services that they provide is a certain proportion of the armored scale population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Pretty so, scary if you're one of the scale insects. Yeah, it could be scary. I mean, but, but in the end, it seems like they're actually doing quite well, like they're benefiting quite a bit from these relationships. So it seems like even though the ants are actually eating the scale insects, this is stable through time the way the fungus gardening ant interactions are also stable through time. Like, with that kind of do, we can still have an interaction that lasts. Yeah, it seems that way. I mean, these associations are, um, they're, they're again going back about 40 million years. Um, so these appear to be quite stable through time. And you know, in much the same way that um, humans farm pigs, you know, the only thing we get out of pigs is meat, right? So we're associated with pigs. We're getting, you know, we're eating them. Um, but pigs actually seem to be doing quite well. You know, there are billions of pigs on Earth. And if you look at their closest living relatives, uh, they are nowhere near as abundant. They don't have anywhere close to the, you know, the sort of global distribution that domesticated pigs have. Um, even though we're eating them, they seem to be doing quite well. Um, and I, I 
think the same thing may be going on with most tarsus and these armor scales. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you're figuring out that the ants are actually eating the scales, because it sounds like the ants are really shy, and you can't just open up the gallery and put yes. your microscope in there and watch it all happen. It is true. As soon as you open up these galleries, most of the workers busy themselves with repairing it and then closing it back up again. Um, so one of the ways in which I have had to you know, use creative approaches to figuring out what is the diet of Melissa Tarsus ants um, uh, is by using what we call stable isotope studies. Um, now, if you think about, you, you're probably all familiar with the food chain and, and food webs, you know, complex food webs. One of the things that uh, researchers have been, one of the tools that researchers have been using to disentangle complex food webs is um, stable isotope studies. And it's basically just a clever way of being able to figure out who's eating food in a system. Um, so I've, I've conducted these stable isotope studies, and what I found so far, what they're indicating is that most of Tarsus ants do have the isotope signature that we would expect for predators of armored scale insects. Um, but again, this is a, an indirect way of looking at the associations, and I want you know some some confirmation um, of you know to to what the stable isotope studies are showing us. Um, so one of the other things that I've been working on is using molecular data uh, as, a, as a cue. And um, essentially what, what I do is um, I can sequence the armor scales that I have from the galleries and you know, sequence certain segments of their DNA, so a couple of genes or whatever, um, and you know, find out what those, what those DNA sequences are. And then I can try to target armored scale DNA from ant preps. Uh, and I approach this in a particular way where I'm separating the gaster of the ants, so this is the, the last segment of their body where most of the digestive tract is found. Um, in particular, this is where the crop is found, and the crop is an organ where, you know, when they're consuming things, they let it gather in the crop, and from there it's digested, okay? So most of the food that they would be eating would be found in the crop. So I actually separate the gaster, from the rest of the ant, and I do two uh, DNA extractions um, to see whether or not I come up with armored scale DNA from these ant preps. And what I've found so far is that, yes, indeed I do. Um, and uh, in, in particular, I find that I get more recovery of armored scale DNA from the gaster than I do from the rest of the ant. Um, I, pick it, I have picked it up in basically every ant that I've tested to this point. Um, so, so that sounds like two lines of pretty strong evidence to say that the ants are in fact eating the scales. Right, so at this point, you know, I have two different, um, two different lines of evidence that are, that are indicating that, you know, that are at least supporting that hypothesis that the ants are the predator of armored scales, but they're associated with Wow. So ants can be crop farmers, dairy farmers, and meat farmers. Yeah, it seems like, you know, if you need an analogy to human agriculture, here are your meat farmers. Yeah. yeah. So even without the honeydew, then, this interaction can be a stable mutualism. So the, the scales are still getting a good benefit from associating with the ants, even though they're getting eaten. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is what I find really fascinating about this system, and this is kind of the... You know, the, the jumping off point that I have for future work on um, this, this system is trying to, uh, uh, trying to figure out how does this relationship work and how does this relationship fit in the conceptual spectrum that we have of you know, mutualism to parasitism. Um, so we have two partners that seem to be associating mutualistically. They both appear to be uh, benefiting from these relationships, but it also appears to be a relationship between a predator and its prey. Uh, and this is where theories start to collide, right? You know, biologists usually think about predator-prey interactions as being antagonistic. Um, you know, the predator benefits, the prey is in trouble. Uh, and if you're a prey species, you really don't want to be associated with your predator, you would think. Um, but this actually seems to be a really unique uh, circumstance where 
a prey species is doing better in the presence of its predator than it would do were it living on its own. Um, so I would really like to, to kind of figure out where does that fit into the conceptual framework that we have established right now. Um, and, and also, you know, eventually look and see whether or not ants are, are doing artificial selection on populations that they're associated with. Um, I think that could be a really interesting line of inquiry. Neat. Well, let's open it back up again for one more round of questions. Um, and if you need to get going, please feel free to step out. Yes. Well, how do you know that the, the insect is benefiting? So how do we know that the ants you know, are benefiting? Or the skeletons? How do you know that they don't, they don't benefit by being independent of the ants? Okay. So, um, there, there are a few um, pieces of evidence that I'm using to, to, make, you know, to, to make that suggestion. Um, there is definitely a need for an actual field study to see whether or not the armored scales that are tended by ants do better in the presence of ants or do better in the absence. That hasn't been done yet, and it's something that I would like to be able to do. Um, but you know, a few of the, the um, the pieces of evidence that I'm, that I'm looking at here are the fact that these populations of armored scales, the ant-associated populations, are massive, massive, massive. So there are you know, potentially millions of individuals in one colony. Um, they're very, very prolific. They seem to be extremely successful. Um, these ants are also very, very abundant, and these, these colonies are very abundant. So you're finding these armored scales all over the place. Um, if you compare that, you know, so if you were to compare the, the number of armored scales that you're finding associated with ants to like the number of armored scales that you would find on the outside just living on their own, it, it's nowhere close in comparison. Um, there are way more armored scales living in these colonies than you would be able to find if you were just looking outside. Well, thank you all for your great questions. Scott will stick around for a few minutes if anyone has anything else.